Welcome back to our next segment of an introduction to Austrian economics. This time we're going to be discussing economic calculation and market profit and loss. We talked in an earlier discussion that every human choice involves a weighing of a cost and a benefit, the deciding between two alternatives, and based upon that decision, uh, deciding which is preferred more and which is preferred less. From the individual's point of view, the alternative that is selected, therefore the choice to be pursued, is viewed as the benefit. The alternative that is foregone, either again for a day or forever, is the cost of your choice. That next best alternative that you would have chosen to do if you had not valued more highly an alternative course of action. Now from this Austrian view of it, another important insight is present. And that is, the very notion of cost and benefit contains within it, is inseparable from the ideas and the concept of profit and loss. To say that you are choosing between two alternatives, and that you decide that A is preferred to B, you would prefer the benefit of the A alternative, even if it involves you having to forego, give up, the B alternative, is to say that on net, all things considered, the selection of one alternative over the other will give you a sense of improved well-being, a gain in satisfaction, a net improvement in your circumstances. That sense that in your mind, you will on net be better off, improved in your circumstances, happier, more satisfied. That sense that this will give, make you better off than that which you forego, that net gain is your anticipated profit from your course of action. Now, of course, not every choice that we undertake turns out the way we want. Again, to use an example, suppose that you decided to go to the movies and to forego two hours of your time and $10 for the ticket that could have been used for something else because you thought that the entertainment of the film would be worth the trade-off of what you had to forego. You come out of the theater and someone asks you, what did you think of it? And you tell them, that's the worst movie I ever saw. The acting was terrible. The plot line was boring. And to be honest, I practically fell asleep. You might very well say within yourself that when I say that is a waste, of, of a waste, you're basically saying that, that those two hours of time and what that $10 that the ticket cost you for what, what it could have been used for instead was of greater value than what you gained. And implicitly, you're saying that you suffered a loss. On net, I've been made worse off due to my choice. Now this again is present in all and every human action. In the marketplace, we think of these in money terms, which we'll be talking about in a minute. But even when we're talking about Robinson Crusoe, isolated and alone on his desert island, having to make his choices as to how best to use his time and his resources and his knowledge to be able to satisfy his basic needs to survive on the island, each and every day, he is deciding, do I pick more berries or do I wade into the lagoon to try to catch some fish? And when he chooses one course of action over the other, he's basically saying at that moment, in that instance, taking the time and my own effort to pick a few more bushels of berries will on net make me better off than the attempt to capture another fish or two by wading into the lagoon. That is the profit of his choice. He, at the end of the day, may regret that he hadn't tried to catch fish because now he decides that he really didn't want to eat, to eat as many berries as he'd collected. But whether it ends up as a profit or a loss, it is inescapable from every choice that he makes. And furthermore, every action that we undertake is therefore profit-driven. Profit is not something that is undertaken only by the businessmen in the marketplace, by the greedy capitalist as some try to portray it as. The profit motive is inherent in the very notion of human action in which choices must be, spent, may, must be made because of the inescapability of scarce means to achieve our ends. Now, elements of this cost and benefit have been emphasized by an economist who was very similar and in some ways parallel to the Austrians, and that is a Nobel Prize winning economist named James Buchanan. Uh, he was one of the founders of what's called public choice theory. But he wrote a great little book, in my opinion, called Cost and Choice, and a number of essays on these themes. And he pointed out that the following th elements can never be escaped 
from the idea of the notion of human cost in decision making. First, cost is subjective. It's within yourself. It's your evaluation of what you think something is worth. Second, cost is based upon anticipations. The act actions of the past are gone. No matter how much we wish we could sort of kick ourselves in the, in the behind and relive our circumstances or go back and rewrite the pages of our own personal history, the only chapters that are still open to us are the ones that are ahead, not behind us. The only choices in which we have to weigh costs are the options that are still before us and not that are closed from behind. Third, cost can never be realized, as he says, because the cost, because of the fact that choice is made. I mentioned this in an earlier presentation, and that is when you ste start, step at the crossroads and you decide to go down one path as opposed to the other, the fact that you took this road and traveled it through real historical time means that the other course not taken is never experienced. You don't know how it would turn out. You don't know what events or activities you might have undertaken if you had followed that path. You don't know its realized history because it never had its realization. It is a might have been that worked on your mind, but it is a not have been. Fourth, the cost cannot be measured by anyone other than the chooser. We think in the marketplace of measuring costs, how many dollars this cost me or how many hours I gave up to do things. But in the real sense, if we understand that what an individual is choosing among are the alternative ends or goals for which common means might have been used, then you realize that it cannot be evaluated, measured by anyone by the, by the decision maker. I may spend available means of money and time and my labor to do one thing or another. But the significance, the importance, the relevance of the cost before me or the cost that I forego can never be known by anyone else but me because it has only existed as an alternative, an end, a course of action foregone in my mind and therefore can finally be borne by no one but me. And finally, Buchanan suggested that cost can be dated at the moment of final decision or choice. It is when I'm at the crossroads and I make the decisive decision to go to the left instead of the right, or the right instead of the left. And if you will, the Rubicon is crossed, the die has been cast, that the choice is born. When you have foregone and, in a sense, co-opted the ability to do the alternative. Now, all of this, these meanings of costs and benefits of profit and loss, are only known, therefore, to the weighing, evaluating, and choosing individual who is facing alternatives. But how do we then apply this? How do we give it relevancy or meaning or, if you will, a degree of objectivity in the marketplace? This is done through the emergence of market prices. The institutions of the market economy enable individual subjective valuations to be transformed, in a sense, into measurable magnitudes for purposes of what the economists, especially the Austrians, have called economic calculation. Now, the Austrians have argued that there are three inescapable and inherently necessary institutions that must be present and effectively functioning for subjective costs and benefits, profits and losses, to have this objectified form for purposes of actual calculation. First, there must be private ownership of the means of production. Things must, be, th things must exist and people must own them and have the ability to buy and sell them so that through the buying and selling, they can demonstrate, they can manifest, they can express to others in the prices they would be willing to pay or the prices they would insist upon having, the objectified form in those prices of what they think things are worth and therefore what they would be willing to give up to get something else. This means that market exchange must exist for both consumer goods, the finished things that we buy in the supermarkets and the stores, and for the factors of production, the land, the labor, the resources, the raw materials, the capital equipment, so all of these can be owned, evaluated by the owner, 
and decided what value he places upon them and express it in the form of what he would be willing to give up or he insists on having in exchange for something else. And finally, there must be a medium of exchange, a money that can serve as the common denominator through which all of the things in the marketplace can be expressed in terms of a common unit for comparison, evaluation, judgment, and decision. As Mises himself said in his famous book on socialism, capitalist economic calculation, which alone makes rational production possible, is based on monetary calculation. Monetary calculation provides a guide amid the bewildering throng of economic possibilities and gives direction and purpose and orientation to everything that people do. Therefore, it is competitive markets and market exchange that enables the emergence of money prices. What is it that you would be willing to take to sell me something? What am I willing to pay to get it? And therefore, the valuations are expressed in a common form that all can compare and judge, evaluate. But while prices do this, in the market economy, the essential actor for whom these prices are most important in the social system of division of labor is that person who we talked about earlier, and that is the enterprising entrepreneur. He is the focal point. He's the hub of the economic wheel who connects everything and everyone together as if through the spokes that center on the hub of the wheel. How so? He is the one in that division of labor who takes upon himself the decision-making, the judgment, and the uncertainty of what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, in what quantities to produce, and for whom and in what, and in what possible prices. He is the one who, dis, who evaluates and decides what could be more profitable and less profitable. What combination of resources would minimize my expenses? Which line of production could earn me a profit? Which one, given the expenses relative to what I think consumers would pay, might generate me a loss, and one, therefore, I would choose to set aside? Now, what is crucial in this is that while prices are objectified evaluations, at the same time, the prices that the entrepreneur is concerned with is neither the prices of the past nor the prices of the immediate present. These are merely symbols and signs and indicators that the entrepreneur uses as baseline elements to make a judgment about the possibilities that still lie ahead in the future. The entrepreneur, as we already saw, is someone who imagines the possible shape of things to come. What is it that consumers would want? What value might they place upon it? How might the resources be combined if I purchase higher rent or borrow them? How long and what forms will the production processes take? And if I undertake production processes of this type with these expenses, will the revenues that I might earn be greater or less and therefore earn me the profit I hope for or generate the loss that I would prefer to avoid? These future evaluations are in the mind of the entrepreneur. In this sense, the entrepreneur creates his profit opportunities by the way he sees the possibilities of the future. Again, Ludwig von Mises emphasized this very clearly and succinctly when he said the driving force of the market process is provided neither by the consumers nor the owners of the means of production, land, capital goods, and labor, but by the promoting and speculating entrepreneurs. These are the people intent upon profiting by taking advantage of what they perceive are imagining as the possibilities in the prices of the present and of the future. As he said, it is the entrepreneurial decision that creates profit or loss. It is mental acts, the mind of the entrepreneur, from which profits ultimately originate. Profit, as Mises said, is a product of the mind, of success in anticipating the future state of the market. It is a spiritual and intellectual phenomena and not 
merely an objective amount of sums of money or uses of resources or quantities of labor. It is the creative act of the entrepreneur in his fantasizing and imagining of the future that shapes the possibilities of profits that may arise. Now, Mises is a student who I've also talked about, Israel Kersner, and who has devoted a very systematic and developed conception of the entrepreneur. In fact, used this type of notion of the entrepreneur alert to opportunities and creatively taking advantage of them. He saw this as a basis that could serve as an ethical justification for profit. The entrepreneur sees opportunities. He observes in his mind potentials and resources and their uses. And as such, he sees things that were not there before, Kersner says. And by seeing things that were not there before, he therefore brings them into existence as resources, ways of doing things, and as finished products that creatively and innovatively and realistically would not have ever had their materialization if not for his mind and the actions that he un undertakes on their basis. And as such, Kersner says that common sense and everyday senses of intuitive reasonableness suggest that profit follows logically from a finder's keeper sense of the ethics of a person who discovers things first has a right to keep it. As he said, we argue that profits grasped by the entrepreneur are in the nature of an unowned, unperceived object, first discovered by an alert pioneer, who in the view of many becomes the legitimate private owner of that which he has discovered on the basis of this finder's keeper's ethics. This is what enables the entrepreneur to do what he does. Mises often emphasized that, that, that economic calculation is in fact the building block, the compass, without which rationality of deciding what to produce and how to produce, and to combine all of the heterogeneous physical things of the world can be reduced to a common and simple homogeneous uh, denominator through which all in the complexity of the world can be compared and evaluated by a simple standard that enables a judgment, profitable or not, more profitable, less profitable, loss-making or not, and therefore act in ways that can satisfy the consumers while efficiently using the resources and raw materials at people's disposal to get the most out of what we have in the pursuit of that cooperative competition that enhances the wealth and prosperity of all in the society. Until next time. Music